Welcome to Common Sense. Uh, Common Sense is a series of shows that feature interviews with uh, interesting people and uh, uh, tells us in a uh, clear, concise, and direct way who these folks are, uh, what they do, and uh, what makes sense to them and what doesn't. Uh, I'm Rudy Breglia, and today I'll be interviewing uh, the uh, wise and generous uh, executive director uh, of the award-winning and volunteer-based Lorain County Free Clinic and uh, a dedicated uh, volunteer physician to that clinic, Dr. Diana Pye. Welcome. Thank you. And thank, thank you for, you for your us. service. Uh, the, uh, Paul, why don't we start with you? Okay. Why don't you give us some background, uh, how you've come to the area, you know, that kind of information. Sure. Well, thank you for having uh, both of us this morning. And uh, I'd like to just start by saying that I was uh, born in Lorraine County. I grew up in Lorraine. Okay. And uh, I still live in uh, Lorraine County. I live in Amherst and uh, went to uh, college in Ohio and uh, came back and, uh, and found myself working in Lorain County and uh, okay. continued my current career uh, right up to this moment. Okay. Well, uh, tell us about your history with the uh, nonprofits. Well, with nonprofits, it, it, it was a tricky thing. I, I didn't expect this as I was a college student, uh -huh. uh, but I did do some philanthropic work in college, which always appealed to me okay. uh, to doing that. And I got involved with a, uh, a local physician and other medical uh, professionals and found myself in the Dominican Republic on a couple of occasions wow. doing medical work. And I saw the great need in the hillsides of this country. And it's particularly the, 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 the poverty, but the hunger and, and ways for us to give back and to help. And, and so I, I, I did a couple of missions with this and that sort of was the seed that started it. Still not realizing that I'd be uh, looking to get into the medical aspect or healthcare section okay. sector of, the, uh, of work. Uh, but I did find myself, after I had come out of college and, and worked in radio for a while, uh, I found myself at Second Harvest Food Bank of North Central Ohio. Okay. And there I, I worked for eight years and uh, finished there as the assistant director. And then the current uh, position, Lorain County Free Clinic, uh, position became available, and that's where I started my a journey in in healthcare and bridging those gaps to uh, people that just uh, can't uh, otherwise afford it or, or have access. Okay, well, I can see what prompted your interest in, in uh, organizations uh, like that and, and helping people. Uh, did you have a role model uh, growing up? Sure, I, you know, growing up, you know, we, every kid has certain role models. They might be public r role models, mm -hmm. uh, might be uh, uh, somebody that uh, is close to them. Mine happened to be my grandfather. And the reason being, this particular grandfather, they were all great, by the way. Okay. <laughs> this one, though, took the time uh, in my young life to, to teach me a lot of the fundamentals of, of life. Uh, things you don't, may, maybe you don't learn at home, or things that you don't learn in school, at least back then. Okay. Um, and you know th things like uh, uh, how to change a tire or to cut a, a, okay. a limb from a tree, All right. or how to navigate in uh, I I around town, or who to trust and who not to trust. And so, my grandfather, over a period of time, took a lot of uh, wisdom, and it, it stuck. And so, I think that. I still hold him up uh, uh, in high regard for the way that, um, that, that that's helped me even today. Okay. All right. Well, that's that's wonderful. Uh, uh, why is it important for people to become involved in uh, uh, charitable, uh, community-related activities? Well, I think a very basic reason is it's it's because it's the right thing to do. Okay. Okay. I think you need to. Uh, your community depends on you giving back or yeah. participating 
at some level. But it also, <clears throat> it also really uh, is a reward for you. When you give back, there are, uh -huh. there are takeaways. Understand. And those takeaways yeah. help build yourself and your esteem or, or whatever it is that you're needing. But it, it does make a difference in, in not only your life by giving back, but it helps tremendously uh, the mission of the particular organization. It doesn't need to be in medical. It could be in anything. Uh, it could be a pantry program. It could be mentoring. It could be any number mm -hmm. of things that you can get involved with. You just align that passion and you go to work. Mm -hmm. Understand. Uh, if I can switch gears a little, Dr. Pai, uh, uh, why don't you tell us about your background and uh, how you came to this area? Uh, I am a, a general internist. Okay. Um, I was trained at Bellevue Hospital, and because my husband got a job at NASA, never been to the Midwest, first time arriving. <laughs> I see. Yes, that's over 30 years ago. And I've always worked in county hospital. And about 10 years ago, um, you know, things in medicine has changed quite a bit. You bet. And the pace of which we're seeing patients, I couldn't keep up. So to be honest, uh, I was burned out. And okay. um, it was something happened. They shortened our visits to 20 minutes, a new patient. Um, in three months, I was out of job. I never really quite... Even today, I was thinking back, like, how did that all happen? <laughs> but it was <laughs> yeah. a very short uh -huh. time. And right before I left, I have this intelligence to uh, worry that, you know, I, you know what am I going to do with my clinical medicine? I start calling all the clinic, free clinic around the area to see if okay. I can just do something to keep myself occupied. And uh, of all the places, Paul was the first one that got me back. I called in the morning. He was back in the afternoon. <laughs> Join us. I'll pay for your malpractice. You can start anytime you want. You come as often or as little as you want. Um, that right. really saved my life. And that was over, that's almost 10 years ago. Yes. Almost uh -huh. 10 years ago. And that's how I got started okay. in the free um, clinic. Uh, why is it important to you to volunteer? at the clinic? Um, for me, it is the only connection, I have to be honest, that I have with clinical medicine. Um, I did two <laughs> things, actually. When I left my job 10 years ago, I actually signed <coughs> up for an introductory writing class in English in the Lorraine, uh, in Lorraine County uh, Community College. Uh -huh. And that also absolutely just opened my eyes and changed my life. So I, I took two things. I started writing. Now I'm writing a health column uh, for the Bay Village uh, Westlake Observer. Oh, okay. And, I've seen um, it. Yeah, it's just a really fun, Good uh, yes, citizen-driven newspaper. <laughs> and so to me, going to the free clinic was really, you know, because I, you know, over there, um, it's like a family. It's a very small operation. Um, you Wonderful. know, the nurses volunteer, I'm volunteer, we have a student who follows me, and um, we have a, a small staff, but everybody is working diligently, and they cater to the way I practice medicine. They just know how, they, they always tell me, say, Dr. Pai, don't you dare call yourself slow. So I, I don't want to use a word, but I do take more time. And Deliberate. Uh, yes, mm -hmm. and the clinic, you know, they schedule me a patient every hour. It doesn't matter if it's a new patient or wonderful, follow up. Wonderful. Can you imagine that? Yeah, yeah. You know, people That's have wonderful. time to talk about what they need to. I get a chance to say what mm -hmm. I want. Take my history. I don't feel rushed. Okay. And that's the, really the most important thing. It's that family. It's like get a chance to practice. You know, like a medicine is also, it's science, but it's also art. Right. And I just like that time. I like to listen to stories, and, and I really, really get a great chance to do that. Well, that sounds wonderful. Uh, uh, Paul, uh, how did uh, Lorraine County Free Clinic get started? Well, back in 1986, we uh, were coming out of a pretty lengthy and severe depression. Uh, Recession, I'm sorry, recession. Okay. <laughs> and as part of the re recessionary process, we f started to see people that were needing not only food assistance, but losing their jobs. And then 
after losing their jobs, eventually losing their health care. And interest rates had soared in housing and affordable housing was an issue. Uh -huh. All of that good stuff or bad stuff. And a group of community leaders in Lorraine, as well as uh, clergy and the medical community in Lorraine, uh, got together and said, hey, why don't we set up a temporary program that provides health care, medical care, to people that have lost their health insurance. And so that was sort of the genesis okay. uh, of that. And so a group in Lorraine uh, known as the, and it still exists today, the Lorraine uh, Cooperative Ministry, they had a wonderful food distribution program, uh, distributed government commodities, you remember uh -huh. cheese and, and flour and rice and all. I remember that. And, um, and they got together and they pooled people from the various hospitals, uh, community, Hot Lorraine Community Hospital at the time, now Mercy, uh, the University Hospitals, which was O'Leary Memorial Hospital at the time, and Oberlin, and o Oberlin Allen Memorial. Okay. And they pulled together these people from these communities and said, here, this is what we've got. And the phone rang off the hook. People would line up. To, to come to see a, a physician uh, at the free clinic. And that's really how it got started. And so this temporary program, now 36 <laughs> years later, <I> <laughs> we're still around. And we're still bridging those, uh, the, 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 those gaps that exist in, in healthcare uh, because people cannot uh, necessarily afford uh, the costs. Mm -hmm. uh, what's the mission statement for the clinic? The mission statement of the Lorraine County Free Clinic is very simple, and it's to provide quality health care to the uninsured or the underserved. And mm -hmm. uh, it, it doesn't get any cleaner than that. Okay. Uh, what are the gaps in our health care system, uh, and who are the patients that fall into them and are served by, by the clinic? Well, we could probably devote a whole hour to to the the subject of gaps in healthcare, but for uh, simplicity purposes, really, it, it's today, and it, maybe it was in '86 or 1990, a little different in, in that regard. But today, it's driven by a, a couple of economic forces, and that's the costs of of healthcare, healthcare insurance premiums. Uh, medicines, the cost of medicines. We read about it daily. Uh, the cost of insulin or the cost of certain medications for diabetes, cancer drugs. That's the whole reason uh, cancer drugs, the cost of, of, of treatments, uh, spawned the, uh, a program that's a great program, and it's a state law. Uh, it's a drug repository program, called, and it was a bill called Karen's Law, and it provided medicines that were being dumped or burned uh, uh, for many, many years to patients in need. And the, the source of those medicines simply was from nursing home or nursing home facilities where those were sent back, the drugs were, and then they were under law, uh, there's certain process to, to then redistribute those oh, pharmaceuticals okay. so that it would eliminate waste. And so gap-wise, uh, we, we, we filled a gap there by reducing medical waste, at least in the state and maybe throughout parts of the country. But when it comes to the patient, it, it, it really comes down to employment, okay? So you have a, a full-time job, you may have benefits, but along with those benefits are your share of the premium uh, of, of, of if you don't have it 100%. Uh, there's costs for medicines. Uh, there may be a, a situation where you work multiple part-time jobs and mm -hmm. health insurance may not be covered. And so the typical patient that we see at the free clinic they are, are, is 19 to 65. That's our range, okay? So it's an adult that's too rich for Medicaid, okay? Okay. Or too young for Medicare. Okay. And so when you're employed and you don't have access to a certain level of health care, affordable health care, then what happens is that you choose not to take it, elect not okay. to take it. And as we grow older, 
okay? You get sicker. And, and yeah, it, things start to pop up, as we all know. And uh, a lot of times what happens is that patients prolong, they delay care. They may not be 100% compliant with what that doctor says for you to do. And it, it, um, it turns into a, a financial crisis, not only for major the patient, problem. major problem, but it's costly for the healthcare system. And yep. they have to pass that along. So the gaps are, are, are really economic forces and patients' ability to pay uh, or to, uh, to, to afford healthcare or to maintain it. And really, it, it, if you, the free clinic serves as that safety net. So it's, it's a temporary, still temporary in a yeah. lot of ways for the patient. Right. Is that hopefully they can come in, they can correct some things, get on that path to wellness, and then hopefully go out into the workforce and find uh, ways to uh, continue that, uh, you know, that plan. Um, uh, understand. Uh, what are the ultimate goals for the clinic? Well, first and foremost, the, the, the ultimate goal is, is to make sure that we remain uh, a beacon uh, of hope mm -hmm. for people that may not know who we are or are just learning about us, but to know that it's a safe place to come. It's, you're going to get some of the best quality care in Lorain County, if you come to the Lorain County Free Clinic. And, you know, it's just, it's one of those things that we need to keep that light lit for people. And our job is to make sure that people in our community know about us. And so that's one of the reasons I'm here, is okay. so I could at least try to share that. Communication, yeah. Communication, right. And to let people know. And I ask people, uh, when I go to presentations or talk to people in groups or, or what have you, I, they say, well, what, what can we do? And one of the things that they can do, there's many things you can do, but one of the things is that you can be sort of like an ambassador to the free clinic. So you may know someone in your community, in your school, at your office, uh, maybe a civic organization you belong to, that's going through some difficult times health-wise or may insurance-wise it may not have access but they're pushing it off or prolonging things you can let them know that free and charitable clinics not only exist in Lorain County but we have 55 of them in the mm -hmm. state of Ohio 1200 nationwide and they exist to do just that and that's mm -hmm. to keep people out of the hospital or worse <laughs> and um, so really those are the, the that's the goal and the other goal obviously is that we're a non-profit organization 501c3 charitable organization and the goal is to stay open <laughs> okay you know, always very important very yeah. important we don't get government funding we don't have a service revenue stream so if you come to the free clinic you're not going to get a bill from dr pi mm -hmm you're going to get the best quality care that you can, but it's our job to make sure that we keep those lights on and we're functioning and moving forward through a very often very difficult health care terrain uh, that, that is out there. It's changed so much five years ago, ten years ago. And so those are, are two very important goals. Now, there's programmatic goals that we would like to do. We'd like to reach... Um, into some rural areas in Lorain County, maybe some underserved adjacent areas of other counties uh, out there. So we're looking at those things, but those types of pie in the sky goals were sort of thwarted because of COVID and you know things changed. Understand. And so that's the terrain I'm talking about too, is you have to be flexible and you have to be able to roll with it and uh, and do uh, the best you can with the resources that you have. Uh, understand. Uh, uh, Dr. Pai, uh, what medical services are available both at the clinic and uh, off-site? Uh, so that is a very good question. A lot of people don't realize that in the free clinic itself, we provide primary care. So these are the doctors that you go to right off in the beginning. Any questions, anything that you don't know about, 
Um, we do have specialty services that come through the clinic as well. Okay. Um, we have dermatology. We have uh, diabetes training, nutrition, podiatrist uh, for counseling. Um, we also have the orthopedics um, and also vision care. Okay. Uh, but if we need anything more complicated than that, we do refer to the three hospitals that work with us okay. um, who you know, go on a three-month rotation. Uh, it's Mercy, EMH, and also Cleveland Clinic. Okay. So our patients get all the necessary blood tests done. They get their necessary imaging study done. And if they have a much more complicated thing like surgery, need biopsies, um, specialties that we don't have over there, that's who they will be seeing out there. So we do have a very comprehensive, uh, just the only difficulty is that maybe not everything can be done on site. Like if you go to a big hospital, everything would be in the same building. But with us, we're solidly primary care. And we also dispense flu shots, for example, when the season is right. Oh, okay. But for, for some of the other stuff, they may have to go to the different hospitals, but they will get it eventually. Uh, understand. Uh, what are the health conditions that commonly incur in patients uh, that you see at the, uh, at the clinic, and uh, what are the causes of those? So um, because we're in primary care, so the most common condition are going to be what the rest of the population has. We have high incidence of diabetes. Okay. We have hypertension, thyroid issue, depression, um, substance abuse, um, you know, so those are the, the king thing, you know, asthma, COPD, mm -hmm. you know, the regular. Uh, but I do want to say the, 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 the to, to kind of focus on what Paul is saying too, I think one of the most powerful thing about the free clinic is that when the patient leaves, we make sure they have medications in their pocket. Okay. So a lot of patients <clears throat> go to different places, your doctor writes a prescription, you go to the pharmacy, the insulin, long acting one costs several hundred dollars a month. That yeah. is their starting price, they are no generic. But when they come to the free clinic, we have long acting insulin in the refrigerator. Patients will walk out there, we have a pharmacy. That we have the most basic insulin um, and also asthmatic medication, very expensive, we have all of that and also, you know, some of the blood pressure medication, a whole bunch of other things. There's a, a very well-equipped pharmacy. And then for some patients who can't afford it, there is a person devoted, for example, working with a pharmaceutical company. You know, that massive amount of paperwork we do. Oh, okay. Just so that the patient can get their drugs free or with a discount. And we maintain that uh, paperwork going so that they don't have to worry about it. Okay, that's wonderful. Uh, uh, what impact does the clinic have on uh, emergency rooms uh, in the area? Very good question. If you have always strong primary care, you will reduce emergency room visits. So a patient who are well taken care of, diabetes are, you know, known. If there's some ulcer that develop, right, comes to me, I will evaluate this and I'll send it to the appropriate surgeon or I will try to take care of the diabetes, do the dressing, help them in the clinic. If this clinic doesn't exist, the patient will end up in the emergency room when the toe is just necrotic, you know, emergency. Yeah, understand. It is, it is just catastrophic. Sometimes it's just even that few days, it would make such a big difference. And that's why primary care is really, really important. Okay. Uh, uh, Paul, uh, can you tell us a little bit about the functions that you uh, perform for the clinic? Uh, myself? You, yeah. yeah. Well, I, I tend to be the spokesperson uh, for, oh, <laughs> <handsome. laughs> uh, for, for the clinic. I, I think uh, one of the main responsibilities is, is in area, two areas, uh, is in volunteer relations, and that is uh, it's uh, sometimes it's like uh, swimming upriver, uh, just because of uh, the way healthcare is today. But we are a volunteer, medically volunteer-driven organization. Okay. And we rely on the generosity of medical providers, volunteer medical providers at every level, to get to where we need to be uh, in functioning. So it, a lot of times I spend. Uh, 
those moments trying to encourage medical personnel, doctors, nurse, nursing professionals, uh, pharmacists, to get involved. But also we have, the best way to do that is to have a good sharp pair of scissors in your pocket. And, <laughs> and what I mean by that is, is that you can cut through a lot of the red tape in, this, in the healthcare systems if you're well positioned within a relationship framework with those hospital systems. And so I, okay. I, I try to spend some time developing those higher level communication okay. channels with, uh, with various hospital systems so that if I need something, I'm not doing it cold. They know who we are, they know who I am, they know, what, they know that they have personnel that they're not forced to volunteer at the free clinic uh -huh. by any means, but they know that they exist, they do come to the free clinic. So it, it, it sort of softens the ground uh, a little bit okay. to, to do that. The other area is, is fundraising, fund development. And yeah, it's great to get financial contributions to help pay for medicines because they're very expensive. It's great to be able to provide medical malpractice insurance for our providers. It's, uh, it's also very important that I have a small staff and that we keep the, 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 the small staff employed. Uh, we did that throughout the entire COVID. We never shut our doors. Not one single person wavered during uh, the start of that uh, uh, pandemic in, in March of 2020. And we remained open and we remained accessible to our patients. And so I think you have to invest in not only your, uh, your, your daily administrative clinical staff, but you have to invest in your volunteers and your medical people that make, make, make the whole thing work. And uh, so I spend a lot of time um, in areas of public relations and it's, it's great to be able to uh, to share the mission because it speaks in a lot of ways. I don't have a, whole, a hard job because it speaks for itself. I mean, uh, it, Diana, you, you demonstrated that for 10 years. And so you, you speak for yourself, you heal for yourself and, and, and for others, obviously. So uh, those are the main responsibilities. Mm -hmm. Well, what best prepared you for this work? Well, I think, um, uh, a good work ethic growing up. You know, I, I delivered the plane dealer when I was a boy. You know, uh -huh. my father was a journalist uh -huh. and he worked for the Cleveland Plain Dealer and he was very accustomed to deadlines and uh, not missing work and he was, um, he was a good writer too. Uh, that's for sure. And um, he, uh, He's, he taught me the importance of, and my grandfather, my, my whole family, my, my mother's a school teacher, so the work ethic was there. So that was, that was ingrained very young. And uh, that prepared me, but then the, some of the choices that I made by luck probably, you know, the medical mission work with um, the late, uh, great Dr. Dennis Radefeld, general surgeon in Lorraine, uh, headed that up, learned a lot under him in in, in that process. Uh, then working at Second Harvest, that really showed me how caring Lorraine County is from every corner. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. um, it's just a a very we have a wonderful network of organizations and a network of organizations in this county that if you were in need of something we'll find a way to get you help. <laughs> and that, above and beyond healthcare. So it could be uh, any number of things. And so I learned a lot of that early on in, in, in my career about, of how different organizations respond to certain things in the community uh, that life deals us. And uh, so th that trans, Transitioned me quite well into into healthcare, and and so mm. I, I I followed this path, and there were days probably I didn't realize I was on that path because you know you're young, and but but I learned a lot. 
Uh huh. Understand, and I could see where uh, where it's done a lot a lot of good. Uh, the uh, uh, tell us a little bit about the details of your organization. How many patients come through the clinic? Uh, uh, you know that that kind of thing. Uh, the 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 kinds of dollars that are involved in in Medicaid. You know uh, th those kinds of details. Yeah, and you know that question about the number of patients it has been to the at one end of the uh, of the spectrum it has been where it's been at at or above capacity where we didn't have enough providers to 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 do that to to do the job and it has and so that translated into a, a way it might have taken back in 1980 seven, you know, four to six weeks to see a doctor once the, really, once the word got out. Uh -huh. And then as we move through time, things like Medicaid expansion came into to effect. Uh, the Affordable Care Act uh, was introduced. And so a lot of these mechanisms sort of took the heat off of the, the pure charitable things because there was, there was access yeah. to medical care. Support, and support, and uh, so there, um, and so that those numbers again, you have to be flexible. Have ebbed and flowed over time, and uh, one of the things that we're looking at right now, uh, during the COVID uh, pandemic, at the start of that, uh, the emergency pandemic rule was in effect. It still is, and it, it, it's going to expire here very soon. Yeah. But what that meant was is that anybody that needed to be seen by a doctor that could, would be qualified for Medicaid, okay? So, and that you could not remove them even if they didn't qualify and under the rules of a federal pan, uh, national pandemic. And so that too uh, helped take some of that burden off of us. And uh, we were able to to really focus, and we used that time to shore up our resources, our medical providers, uh, our, our funding, uh, any number of things, capital improvements and things. Those things that you really couldn't accomplish when you're in that, oh, my God, crisis. <laughs> right. And so... Uh, we 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 take the the waves and we ride them accordingly. But to, to answer your question, 19 to 65 is the age. Now, there's always exceptions to the rule. Uh -huh. I've had children that have come through that have maybe have come out of from out of town and don't have uh, Medicaid or, chi or, or you know, access to mom and dad's insurance, but are asthmatic and they don't have they left their inhaler at home. Uh, Mm -hmm. There have been wonderful opportunities to, to help children that were struggling at school or maybe their first part-time job because they were having difficulty seeing because they needed glasses and dad couldn't afford prescription lenses. And so we were able to, to help those types of, of individuals as well. But the typical person that we see is, is a female, and she is between... 35 and 59, and 75 percent of the patients that we do see have one or more part-time position mm -hmm. or a, a job, rather. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, we could see uh, 15 patients in a day. We could see. Uh, I remember at the height of things, we were well over 300 patients per month. Uh, and so it's going to. We're we're at that that lower end right now. Okay. Uh, What's going to happen is once the medical uh, pandemic emergency is lifted, folks that are on Medicaid right now are going to be removed. And there's going to really only be a couple of options for those patients uh, that right now, once they do not have access to public benefits, and that is that they're going to go to an emergency room. They're going to find, hopefully, a free and charitable clinic or a federally qualified health center. Uh, or they're going to do without. Uh, and again, we talked about that, about prolonging care and what that means. Uh, hopefully what happens is that they, as the economy adjusts and gets back to a certain level and the workforce 
in this county can stabilize and it, it, there, there'll be jobs for people that will have some benefits that they can afford so that they won't go without. That's the bottom line is we can't afford to let people go uh, without uh, health care and seeing somebody like Dr. Pai because they can't afford it. Under, understand. Uh, uh, tell us uh, uh, how can someone qualify for uh, treatment at the, at the clinic? Well, uh, in general, again, 19 to 65, but there's exceptions. Uh, at or below 250% of the federal poverty level, and that's determined based on your income, your monthly income, and household size. Okay, so there's a formula that the federal government releases every year that we use. They can simply, they can go online to our website, and this will all probably be on, on the screen, uh, but to, to our website, they can call us, uh, and we'll be happy to have them uh, apply. It's, it's pretty easy, and uh, there's a few things that they have to, to, to demonstrate or to, to share with us, and then they're given an appointment, and it's pretty quick. I, mm -hmm. mean, I mean, I bet we can see somebody within a week, mm -hmm. and uh, that gets the ball started. Uh, how, how did COVID affect your activities? Well, probably just like everybody else. It was, um, it, you know, everybody said... It was a that, flood. Yeah, it, it, it was a, a flood of, of phone calls, and uh, there was a lot, uh, as you can imagine or, or remember, not even imagine, remember, and to, to a certain extent still exists today. There's fallout from COVID, and, but during that time, there was a lot of anxiety. There was a lot of, mm -hmm. there was a lot of things going on. A lot of uh, wandering aimlessly. We all had that fog about us, you know, yeah. like, and that's that fear that oh my god, what uh, if I get COVID yeah. and 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 all of that. And so we we remained open. We were committed to staying open. Now there was a period of time right when the when COVID, uh, you know, shut everything down. Okay. Uh, stay at home type stuff that we didn't see patients for a few weeks in our office. So we started doing telemedicine and we always made our, or our doors were always open. So if somebody needed a medication refill, we would connect the physician with our office staff with the patient so that patient could come to our office or go to a pharmacy and pick up their medicine so that there was no interruption mm -hmm. for that. We served a great deal of information and referral, things that we couldn't do during the early part of the pandemic. We, we knew other places that might be able to or to do. So we acted as a, uh, as a conduit for information and referral. So we would physically, you didn't get a prompt or a menu to push on the phone. You had a, a live person that lived <laughs> in, in and worked in Lorraine County that knew where to send you. And so that's how we operated, and we operated that way for many months. If in months probably turned into years, but we're still we're wide open now, obviously. But COVID um, has affected the globe, and it's um, we were no exception. The uh, uh, how many staff and volunteers do you actually have at the clinic? Right now, I have three full-time staff members, uh -huh. and I have uh, six part-time. Uh, employees. Uh, many, uh, I would say many, 90% have been with the organization for 10 or more years. Uh, uh -huh. We uh, and, and we have about, when you count it all up, uh, volunteers, medical volunteers, that includes professional level people like have my board of directors as well, which is small, but we have about 200 uh, volunteers in any given capacity. Okay. Um, uh, do you need more volunteers? We always are looking That's for specific. That's a leading question. Yeah, huh? that is a leading question. <laughs> yeah. Right now, what what's happened is is that Dr. Pai has has mentioned this earlier the 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 subject of burnout and being worked hard. So what I mean by that is that that. To answer your question, yes, I need some specialists, as an example. 
I need an orthopedic physician or an orthopedic professional, nurse practitioner, PA, all of we can include all of this. I could use, as is another example, uh, rheumatoid arthritis physician. Uh, there, there are others um, that we could benefit from. What happens, though, is that in the current lay of the land in healthcare today is that there are, across the board too, shortages of people working. That's why, you know, any, anybody that's leaving nursing right now can find a job pretty quickly, mm -hmm. you know. They, they, I mean, it's, and, and the pay is, is really good. And so the job market is wide open for people who want to get into healthcare. But when you're looking at sp certain types of people in certain levels of healthcare, doctors could be mm -hmm. one, um, there may not be enough doctors of that specialty in that hospital. And so what tends to happen is a physician wants to give back she might want to give back, he might want to give back, get involved in the community, but have very long office hours, surgery, whatever the case may be. And then you also see that they tend to be in that time of their life where they've been maybe recently married or they're starting their own family. Yeah. And then there's the other end of the thing where we have elderly parents and, uh, and things are required there. We all have things that are, make us extremely busy at certain parts of our life. And so what happens is that places like a free clinic and other places too don't have people that want to get involved that, that do get involved because there's job requirements and family requirements and, and giving and it's and it's it's volunteer so we're on the low end of the of the pole yeah. life is complicated it can be yeah uh, what are your funding sources well we rely on the generous the generosity of the entire community so our our funding sources are multi-tiered or, or a variety in the toolbox. We depend a great deal on our general support. Okay, so that means individuals, uh, you and I type of people that give because they believe in the mission of the organization. Uh -huh. We have churches and civic organizations, corporations, uh, and we have corporations in Lorain County but also outside. And then uh, Foundations or another uh, same same deal. It could be local. It could be uh, across the border in Cuyahoga. Uh, it or it could be statewide or it could be national. So we have a lot of foundations that are out there that have in their in their scope healthcare and uh, sort of meeting those disparities uh, in in healthcare that that provide funding. So we have to. We can't rely on any one source to make it happen. Our budget, I, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty pleased with what we've been able to maintain. We have an annual budget of $470,000 annually, yet we provide well over 1.5 million in care to, to, to patients, and that's conservative. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's some things you can't really measure the way you'd like to, just because of the nature of the business that we're in, and um, so it's it's a good way, it's a good investment in community health, the Lorain County Free Clinic. So we rely on the generosity of. We have to tell people, hey, your dollar does have a huge impact here, yeah. and uh, but it, it does translate into uh, people getting where where they need to be health wise. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have uh, any fundraising events uh, that you can tell us about? Sure. Well, we had, <clears throat> until COVID, mm -hmm. we had three annual special event fundraisers. And then things went south, and we oh. did not. <laughs> and so we're now in season or number year three that we, we don't. Um, they have not had a, a fundraiser. We had a golf benefit. We had a, a, a spring a wine tasting event, actually right out here in Avon Lake. Uh, we had it in a private home. 
Uh, it was called Taste of Italy, and it was very well attended and uh, well supported. And then in the fall, we had a, an annual uh, sort of a harvest steak fry. And, very, and these events, uh, two of them anyway, were well into, on, on their way to 25 years. And so okay. uh, hopefully 2023 is going to bring back some Those way of, okay. of doing that because it's a good bridge to the community. People enjoy not only the events, but it's, they realize it's, it's, a good, it's a good cause and they want to give back. And that's one way you can give back is to... to to support something like that. Okay. You know, one thing, uh, Rudy, I, uh, what did that mean for us when we had to cancel things starting in the spring of 2020? Each year, 2020, 21, and 22, we lost $65,000 per year, so do, times three. And so we've had to make that up somehow. And it uh, hasn't, uh, hasn't been easy, but hopefully 23 will shine better. Okay, good luck with Thank that. Thank you. Uh, uh, how can Avon Lakers and others support your efforts? Uh, 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 I guess we already talked about volunteering and, and fundraising. Is, is there anything else uh, that Avon Lakers can do? Uh, well, I think... Uh, First and foremost, if you're in healthcare, in the medical field at any level or any angle, and you want to give back to a medical type of an initiative, healthcare related, whether it be public health or like Dr. Pai uh, in an exam room on a monthly basis, uh -huh. uh, you please give us a call. We will certainly um, uh, find you a place, if not at the Lorain County Free Clinic. We have. Uh, we have partners in other counties that are near us that uh, maybe people don't work. Maybe they live in Avon Lake, but maybe work in, in a different area, maybe downtown. There are other opportunities that we could, uh, you know, share with you to, to, for you to explore. Mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, the other is, is a way is, is that, again, to be the ambassador, to, to let people know that there is help. Uh, if you know somebody that is has a health or medical issue and can't afford it, there's no reason that they can't get help. And and we are the, the, the cornerstone of our mission really is to provide, once upon diagnosis is made, is to make sure that we're able to treat th that condition. And that many times is not only just with a procedure, but it's, it's with medicines mm -hmm. and medications. And for many, 75% of our, our patients carry at least one or more chronic conditions. And so that might mean that they have to have medications uh, for a prolonged, if not lifetime, type of a scenario. And uh, so, but to be an ambassador for the, the an advocate for, for the patient to say, hey, You've got this going on. Here's what I can suggest that you do. Why don't you give the, the free clinic a call? And, and then the, the other thing is, Avon, like people can do is to say, hey, I know my physician or my nurse practitioner. Um, mention it to them in their office. Hey, do you get involved with that free clinic over there in Lorraine? <laughs> and <laughs> and it's, uh, I've heard it's good things about it. Okay. And uh, it, maybe they can get involved that way. And then, you know, finally, if, if you'd like to make a, a, a donation uh, to, to the free clinic, a gift, a non-tax-deductible uh, gift to the free clinic, you know, the, we, we would be uh, most appreciative. Uh, that kind of leads right into a question. Uh, where is the clinic located and uh, uh, when are you open and uh, how would we, uh, how would someone contact the clinic? Uh, I think I have a, a slide that... Yep. Uh, well, Lorain County Free Clinic, we, for many years, we were in South Lorain, but five years ago we moved to Oberlin Avenue. So we're at 5040 Oberlin Avenue, Lorain. The uh, phone is 440-277-6641. Uh, Website is lcfreeclinic.org. We're on Facebook. We're on Twitter. There's a variety of ways that you can learn about our mission and how you might help others and to get involved. Uh, in summary, uh, what's making sense to you and, and what doesn't? Well, what makes sense most to me, and I, I keep this at the forefront every day, is that I, when I do come to, to, to work, 
Monday. Uh, by the way, we're open Monday through Friday. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> I forgot to mention that. <laughs> all right. But when I do come in Monday through Friday, all right, uh, I'm reminded about the people like Dr. Pai and the many, many other people that give up uh, uh, their day off or after hours uh, in their time. And that's generosity. Okay. Uh, and uh, there's uh, that generosity means a, a great deal and it means uh, different things to different people. But it, it, I'm reminded that that's working well because to them, in many cases, they're not forced to be there, but they do it because it's the right thing to do. And they, they want to give back. They want to help their fellow, fellow human being. Um, they take that oath to do that anyway. Uh -huh. and, uh, and why not help uh, jump in and help people that the system, whatever system is out there that's uh -huh. failing, okay, uh, to get involved and try to make that better. Uh, what isn't working is, you know, there's a, you know, we can start, that could, that'd be another hour right? <laughs> uh, when we start well, talking about, you, back. you know, when we start talking things like politics and, and costs and, uh, and the way certain places conduct and do business um, that may not be the most efficient. But um, we, to, to inoculate yourself against that, the best form of, of defense is to be flexible and, um, and to be kind to, to all of those that are uh, in your way. And so, um, you know, I, I think that for the most part, we wouldn't be around 36 years um, if there was a ton of things that weren't going right. Um, so we take that into consideration and appreciation. Okay, Dr. Pard, did you want to say anything in summary? Uh, oh, well, if I can uh, drive about this, what makes sense, what doesn't make sense mm -hmm. question, which is very, very good. Um, what makes sense is that, thank God, that Paul is doing all that stuff <laughs> he's talking about, <laughs> funding, coordinating, all these charity organizations working together to deliver care. So I can just play doctors. So that makes sense, and I really appreciate that. What doesn't make sense to me is that um, we do get a lot of patients from emergency room. You know, they see somebody who needs continuity care, they know to call us if they can't go to any other places. On the other hand, like for example, I had a patient that came and told me, say, oh, I wish I were here earlier. I didn't know you guys existed. All I knew is I was driving down Oberlin, saw your sign, desperate, just want to give it a try, end up in our clinic and got everything. So that's what I like to see. What doesn't make sense is that just get the words out. Okay. That people, right. you know, what do you have to lose? Give us a call. Let's do our best for you. Okay. Well, that's wonderful. And, and uh, 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 thank you. I, if I can speak on behalf of the people in, Ava, in uh, Avon Lake and Lorraine County, thank you very much for what you do. Uh, what, uh, the, the kinds of things you do are just wonderful in helping people. And uh, uh, I, uh, I'm, I'm sure that if uh, the, all the people in Avon, Avon Lake and Lorraine County were sitting here, they'd thank you as well. Okay. Thank you, uh, thank you very much for having us. us. Okay. Well, <laughs> thank good. You. I'm, 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 I'm glad you were able to come. Uh, and thank you for watching. Uh, uh, please uh, give us feedback on the show. Uh, uh, if you uh, have uh, uh, someone you know that's interesting or you would like to appear on the show, uh, please uh, send us your contact information. We have uh, c contact uh, addresses at the bottom of the screen and uh, I want you to remember seat belts save lives thank you The preceding program was presented to you by a community producer. The statements, views, and opinions expressed were not necessarily those of ALC-TV or the City of Avon Lake.